just based here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I, we provide education support and advocacy to families impacted by incarceration, Free Hearts does, and we're located actually in North Nashville um, inside of the Magruder Family Resource Center. We work with families that are here and we mostly focus with, on moms and kids. So we know African American incarceration very well, um, as I also am a formerly incarcerated woman. So. Um, the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls is actually a national organization that's based in Boston and Clemmie Greenlee actually brought the organizational you know, chapter down here and introduced uh, the National Council to Nashville. So, yeah. And so, so uh, this organization, <clears throat> what is this organization all about? And why don't you uh, talk about some of your own personal experiences, your background, education, and how you became involved with not only this organization, but say something about your earlier experiences and where you might have gone wrong okay. in your own life in reference to leading you to where you were. Okay, well, starting off with my education, because uh, I'm born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. I've lived in other places, but um, I was born here in Nashville, and I went to Hume Falk um, Academic Magnet High School um, right in downtown Nashville. I went to Middle Tennessee State University. My first degree is in uh, recording industry with music business, um, and my minor was in public relations. And my, I have a master's uh, MBA in information technology, and I'm working on a PhD in public policy right now. And um, the way that I, my path to incarceration may not be the same path to incarceration of other people because I was already actually in my career. And um, I just, I, had, um, I was working in the music industry and basically in my situation, I just was unaware of the laws of another state and I took a firearm that I had registered and permitted here to another state and you know, I declared it at the airport and everything, but uh, was unaware that the laws were different in that state and ended up having to do um, a year on Rikers Island as a result. Never living in New York, from Nashville, Tennessee, and that was my path to incarceration. Everybody's path to incarceration is different, mm -hmm. and you know, when people are like, okay, you did the crime, you did the time, one thing I know, there were so many brilliant women that were in there with me that may have made a wrong choice, may have, had a mental illness that was being, that, you know, was not being addressed for a long time, uh, may have had an illness such, such as a substance abuse or other illness that was not addressed and, and that was their pathway. So everybody's pathway is different and just looking at, um, you know, sometimes it's not always what you did wrong to get to that point, but just, you know, it could almost happen to anyone. You, you really never know. And so um, um, with Free Hearts, what we do here, we provide, again, support, education, advocacy to families impacted by incarceration. For support, we do support groups inside the schools. We do for children whose parents are incarcerated. We do support groups inside the jail, the women's jail. We have mentors inside the prison. We do case management for wraparound services. We also teach parents, uh, parents in classes for uh, people that are trying to reunite with their families. And then we have the Nashville uh, participatory defense hub where we're organizing families of people, loved ones who are currently facing charges to help them to impact the outcome of their cases. And we have um, a storytelling for public policy program where we have our first bill that's been introduced in this session to uh, with a bipartisan support, uh, uh, Representative Gilmore. Okay, let's take this okay. break right here, okay. uh, Ms. Harrington. <laughs> and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Ms. Dawn Harrington, and the issue is African-American female incarceration. And Ms. Harrington has already given us some excellent information in reference to her situation. And now, Ms. Harrington, let's see if we can talk about African-American females in jail. Okay, well, first of all, African-American females are incarcerated at a rate three, uh, I'm sorry, three times more than that of white women. And so it's disproportionately impacting our communities, you know, more than other communities, first of all. And so that means since most women have a child, have children, women that are in jail have children, um, that means that a, a black child, an African-American child, is seven times more likely to have a mother that is incarcerated. So, um, you know, it's, it's just a, impacting us more. When I go, I go into the jail almost every week. When I go in, it's, you see mostly faces like my own, you know, that are in these jails. And so, um, and so, you know, it's, it's just something that has, has always impacted our communities. It's impacted our men. And a lot of times we don't think about the women. A lot of times we don't think about, uh, you know, this is also happening to our mothers, our sisters. And um, I can tell you that it is. Um, women are incarcerated at 700 times more than they were 20 years ago. So whereas it was mostly when you think about somebody that's incarcerated, you may think about a man, but women are being incarcerated way more, you know, and are, and are outpacing the rate that men are being incarcerated at this time. And black and African-American women are at the front of... Um, you mean there are more African-American females incarcerated than male African-Americans overall? No, no, it's not more African-American females than males, but it's just the rate that rate. we're being uh -huh. incarcerated uh -huh. because they were, there's still a greater number of men that are, are being incarcerated than women, than African American women that are being incarcerated. But we, the rate that we're being incarcerated is more than it, was, than it used to be. So they're kind of going at the same rate, but now they're incarcerating way more African American females now than they were. Well, what are some of the challenges that African American females face that are locked up? Um, some of the challenges that African American females face um, include having the resources for like commissary, um, having transportation to get their kids to come see them, to come visit them. And with, it's important for families to be able to connect with each other. In fact, they're about to take out um, face-to-face -face visitation out. First, they're starting with the men's jail, but they're also about to take face-to-face -face visitation out of the women's jail as well. And so basically, when you go to visit your mother in a jail, you're gonna be looking at her from behind a, uh, from behind a tablet. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't be able to give her a hug, you won't be able to see her. And you know, that that is, it's There's inconscionable no, that we would be and, doing that in our no city. Touching, no exactly, exactly. Between the, uh, in, the person who's uh, incarcerated and the person that comes to see them. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And, you know, specific to African American um, women, more of us are in jail, not because we have been convicted of a crime, but because we don't have the money to bail out of jail. And so, you know, that's something that is impacting us more because you, you would think, okay, if a woman is incarcerated, if a woman, if we have a woman in jail, then more than likely they did something. But more, most likely, women from our communities, more often than not, are just sitting in a jail because they don't have the money to post their bail to get out and be able to fight and, you know, actually be innocent until proven guilty. And so no matter what the charge might be, that uh, essentially uh, African-American females generally end up being charged and placed inside of a jail rather than given an opportunity to bond out. Is right. that what we're saying? Exactly. If you don't have the money, mm -hmm. and you know, I've seen a lot of these bails with the, with the participatory defense that we do. You know, some of these bails are ridiculous, you know, and if just you know if you don't know exactly how it works just say if it was three hundred thousand dollars you have to come up with thirty thousand dollars or you have to put somebody's house up 
or something like that to be able to get out of jail. And that's just to be able to prove your innocence. And, um, you know, it, it's a matter of resources because just because you don't have the money to get out of a jail doesn't mean that you are less or more guilty. But our communities, the uh, African American communities, more often than not, we're just sitting in a jail because we don't, uh, until we go to trial, because we don't have the money to get out and bail out. And so uh, whatever the, the offense might be, if you don't have an opportunity to bail out, you have to wait until it's time to uh, be, be charged and have the uh, court hearing. Is that what right, you have to, uh, you go back and forth to court. So, I mean, you might have eight court dates. You know, mm -hmm. you might go, I, one of the moms that we worked with, um, the, the, the witness or the person that was supposed to see what happened, mm -hmm. they haven't showed up. One time they didn't show up, they continued it for you know another month and something. Then another time they didn't show up and they're continuing it again. So it may be not only just one court date, it may be several different court dates. And in fact, we have one African American mother that is, she, she was in a program and she finished her program and she can't get in touch with her attorney. And now she's just sitting there waiting for, hopefully for him to reach out. And so, you know, a matter of, not having the resources, you know, uh, that, that makes a big difference of whether you're just sitting in a jail and away from your family or being able to be with your family while you work through this issue and get to the bottom of it. Well, would you say that there's something between uh, the criminal justice system and the bonding agency? Of, uh, is, is, would that be proper to say? Um, yes, uh, actually there's a, I, I would like to mention Jacola Lane with the uh, Nashville uh, Community uh, Bail Fund. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're doing some great work in trying to, with people with uh, lower bails, trying to help them to get out. And really to sh show that, to use that as evidence to show that just because you don't have the money doesn't mean that you're just going to run off and not go to court. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's showing different, I mean, that's showing, you know, priority to different communities that have more resources. Very good. And of mm -hmm. course, what we'll do, uh, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Harrington, is to take our second commercial break, and okay. then we'll come back and give you an opportunity to talk for about 10 minutes about an, uh, any topic dealing with what we're talking about here. And okay. we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Ms. Dawn Harrington and she's given us some information relative to African American female incarceration. Uh, Ms. Harrington, let's see if we can, during this last 10 minutes, give you an opportunity to talk about some of the things that you would like to uh, make sure that you leave with our audience this morning dealing with uh, the topic that we're dealing with. Okay, well, one thing that I want to leave our audience with today is um, for our city, our city um, claims to be very committed to survivors of domestic violence. And one thing we know that Tennessee is very high for domestic violence homicides in comparison with the country. And um, speaking of African American women that are incarcerated, we have one woman that we work with, Shantonio Hunter who right now is being prosecuted by our DA for the actions of her abuser against her child. And actually her trial is coming up next week. That's why this is at the top of my head. And our DA has, she's African American, and 
they gave her a plea offer, which is a plea a plea agreement offer of 30 years at 100 percent for killing basically her child when she never did it. Her her abuser that was also abusing her, you know. And um, another case that is exactly the same profile, but the woman was a white Caucasian woman, and um, Nina Costanza, she, they, gave her, they gave her a plea deal for 20 years at 30%. So 30 years at 100% for an African-American woman, or 20 years at 30% for a white woman. And just don't get me wrong about this, I don't feel that any woman should be prosecuted for the actions of their abuser against their child. I think we need to help them to heal. I think we need to help them to, to give them support to, to heal their lives. You know, they've already lost the greatest thing they can by losing their child in this whole situation. But to prosecute them, you know, is insult to injury. But with that being said, for an African-American woman, to be, you know, offered way more time and, and for them not to give her a better plea deal just because she's African American, you know, it, it speaks volumes to what is going on in our city. Well, more specific, uh, she's charged with a murder that her abuser committed? I mean, how does that work? I mean, I mean you, know, that's, you tell I mean, me. That's the thing. You but. tell me. That's why, that's why I, I, I highlighted that. But I, like I said, neither one of them should have been charged. No, okay. And and yes, let's go back to that because it, it doesn't make sense to, to, just like you're saying, it doesn't make sense. And she actually has a trial next week. And, you know, I saw the, the DA Glenn Funk in California, because several community members have signed on to a letter that we don't feel that this is, is you know, is just. For her to be charged with the murder of something that, sh that they even have been saying in court, they know that she didn't do. And he said that he would give us a meeting when I saw him in California, and this was in June, and we've been calling and calling, and community leaders have been wanting to talk about it, but you know, we haven't been able to get him Well, let's about see, that. do you know any of the facts on the case? I mean, how, how do you know that it was her abuser who committed the murder than, rather than herself? I mean, talk about it from well, that I, perspective. Well, actually, I've been we coming to the court, and even, you know, in open court, the judge clarified that, you know, so we're not saying that she, or is anybody saying that she did anything to the child? And the DA said, no, they're not. But it's, uh, it, it's a policy that, uh, domestic violence advocates across the country are called failure to protect. So it's when prosecutors prosecute people for not for the action, but they're they're prosecuting the same as if you did it because you didn't you didn't stop couldn't it. stop it. But to me, to charge somebody that's also being abused themselves and that is has survived the abuse basically just for surviving it. Because you could have easily been the person that ended up, you know, deceased. Well, what about the man who is responsible for the death of the child? I mean, she might have... Well, not... he is already, in this situation, he's already been convicted. Oh, so they convicted him. Yes. And then they were, well, they're convicting two persons for the death of yes. that child. Is that what we're saying here? Yes. Uh-huh. And, and, and so you... And, and so you're saying that they have a, there's a policy that allows that? Uh, yes, and you know, our, our city is supposed to be committed to survivors of domestic violence. And this is the second case in a couple of years that has been prosecuted by our city that's along the exact same profile. But the difference with Shantonio Hunter is that she's a black woman and that she has a public defender, not a paid lawyer. And so her outcome, you know, even the offer that she's given is totally different, so. So is there a difference, you think, uh, between uh, African-American females and other individuals in terms of uh, the plea bargain that they're given or uh, that some are uh, given more harsher, uh, longer terms. Do you find that to be true? Yes, I definitely find that to be true. And Chateau Hunter is a perfect example. You and, know. The, but that, you find that to be generally uh, yes, true? Yes, I find that to be generally true. And this just is one illustration of how that is true. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, yes, I do find that to be true. So, um, 
Yes. Well, uh, but there, there's no recourse. I think you mentioned having spoken with the, uh, uh, dis the, was the district attorney in reference to this particular case. Yes, and many community members have wrote him. And, you know, when I saw him in California, he did say, you know, he's received a lot of the, the letters and different things, but he said that domestic violence doesn't excuse you from everything. And, you know, I really don't see where he's coming from with that, but to me, this is just unjust. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unjust, and many community members want to speak with him about it, but we're still waiting on a meeting. Uh -huh. so. And, and so there's a possibility of her being charged with murder in a real sense. She is, she is being charged with murder. She's being charged with murder. That she did not physically commit. Exactly. Well, now, how is it that she could have protected this child from being murdered uh, otherwise? I mean, what's Your the, guess the is as good as mine. I, I, have no, I, I don't understand. To me, it doesn't make sense. You know, I, I wish I could answer that question for you, but I don't know how she could have protected the child. There, I there, don't know. <laughs> there's no story with it in terms of... Now, he was convicted of, of, of the murder of the child. Right. Uh, and he, evidently he was sentenced to so many years and et cetera. But she was not convicted.